Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here for our special seminar. For those online, thank you for uh, watching us online. <laughs> um, so today we only have one seminar, and we are going to hear from Scott Hayden. Um, he's a final uh, year PhD student at Durham University in the UK. And his research interests are within the physics of accretion on the compact objects, mainly focusing on supermassive black holes. Um, he's especially interested in and variability uh, properties of the accretion flow, having developed a model for uh, agent variability to explain the rich phenomenology, phenomenology seen in recent intensive monitoring of campaigns. Um, additionally, he works on understanding the different accretion states in AGM with synergies to change in loop AGM. His recent work suggests the accretion structure depends strongly on mass accretion rate, transitioning from this dominated states to an inefficient X ray plasma. Um, finally, he's a student member of the Creden PV target team for MGC 4151. And so it's increasingly focused on modeling high resolution line profile. And thank you, of course, yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'll be talking today about um, trying to understand the inner structure of the AGM. And will this work? Ah, shit. There we go. Okay. And so we'll be zooming in onto this in the most region, not close to the black hole, where all the power is being emitted and all the power is being generated in the media, where all the exciting stuff is happening in these sort of active black and nuclear nuclei. Uh, the first part of the talk, I'll be focusing mainly on the SED and looking at what that can tell us about the generating structure and the sort of overall course picture of the equation flow. And then we'll zoom in and use the variability to try and look at the detailed structure, um, the detailed structure and the balance and actual physics that are going on. So starting with the SCD, uh, we can think about the, the easiest way to think about the equation flow is the standard Shakur's and Yard disk model, uh, drawn here in pink. And um, the way I like to think about this is you have a material uh, which forms this sort of geometrically quite thin, incredibly dense structure in towards the black hole. Uh, if uh, this um, in standard theory has a nice temperature profile, so if you start in the outer regions, it's cool, and then it heats up to closer and closer, you get to the black hole. And so if this fermatizes, uh, then you can um, think about each radius as emitting a black body of a characteristic temperature. And so integrating over the disk, you build up an SED, which is essentially a multicolored black body or some of black body components, which for AGM tend to predict uh, tend to emit a um, peak in the extreme or divided. However, AGM also always show X-ray emission. And you cannot make this with a standard disk in these systems, they're much too cold. And so you do need an additional component. There are a few different ways to do this. I'll talk about one way of doing it. Um, and that's, you could think about a case where maybe your disk truncates at some radius. And instead of having this geometrically thin, really thick structure, you have a now a geometrically thick, much less dense um, plasma, which takes seed vectors from the disk and constantly scatters them to higher energies. And so it gives you this um, high energy x ray here. But of course, life is never quite so simple. Uh, if you look at data, especially for a nice typical light AGM, quite often when you look in the X-ray, the soft X-ray is down below one or two kV, you see this nice upturn, uh, which is like above your underlying power law, which we dubbed the soft excess. And we don't really know what the soft excess is. Um, one way, again, one of many different models, uh, you can think about it is, okay, maybe my disk is not this standard occurs in our disk that's fermatized perfectly, maybe the split is a bit different so my dissipation has moved up into the photosphere, and so emitting as this sort of nice thermal component, it continues and you get a continuous black body. 
linking your EV emission down to the X-ray and giving you this upturn when you're not in the soft X-ray bypass. Now, these SD models fundamentally depend on the mass and the mass equation that your energy ratio. As that sets how much power you have available in the flow to emit. Um, now you can put this together then into a model which conserves your energy. Uh, and maybe I used to like zero for first order, say, okay, if I have so much energy available in flow, divide my flow into different components, like standard disk, maybe this funky compromised disk or an X-ray plasma. And then say, okay, based on the size of each of these components, how much emission am I getting in each band pass? And so you could do first order, actually, use the SCD to estimate the size scale of each of your emitting components. And what I mean, if you have really, really strong UV emission and quite weak X ray, that's probably telling you the system is mainly disk dominated and you don't have much X ray plasma. Whereas if you're very much dominated by X ray and you've got very weak UV, then that's telling you it's on the other way around. So your flow is probably mostly a plasma, not much disk at all. Now, these FDs I'm showing here have typical AGFC, those nice space long EUV emission. And this comes with a nice side effect in that it's highly ionizing. And so if we zoom a little bit out and look at this structure surrounding our location flow and this one, so we often see these, um, you can imagine this little nice cloud structure, wind structure, something of large scale height, which is orbiting the black hole rapidly and sees this uh, ionizing continuum and so you induce emission lines. And because it's more dynamic, it, gets, it gives you these really broad emission lines. Which is super convenient if you're an optical survey like STSS, because you can make this selection and say, okay, if it looks blue in the optical and it has broad emission lines, it's probably an AGM. And you can use that to define your sample of AGM. The question, of course, is, is that all AGM? So one of the things you can do, and what uh, Jake Mitchell did, is take all of STSS, and then plot it in turn, and then bin all your samples in terms of mass and monochromatic luminosity, where we're saying optical monochromatic luminosity more or less that's mass equation state. And so then you can tell how much power you have available. And then you ask, okay, for um, how many sources do I have at different energy ratios? And you'll see the blue bins, these have thousands of sources in them. But they're all above like a few percent of Eddington. And then if you go to about two percent of Eddington, the number of sources drops off dramatically. There's almost none. And so you can ask, why is that? Do AGM just magically turn off below this um, uh, limit, or is there something extra? One thing you can say is, because I think maybe it's increased dust obscuration or uh, just contamination from the host galaxy. As you uh, go down the mass creation rate, you become fainter, and so you're much harder to detect. It's much easier for dust to dry in the system, so maybe you're more likely to be obscured. Or, alternatively, you can say it's a change in the equation structure itself. Now, focus on the latter um, possibility. And this isn't entirely unmotivated. We see in fairly rare but local objects these dramatic changes in their CD. So the change in look AGM. Well, what you're seeing here is a nice example from Marcarian 110 where the light curve, you have stark face, long, nice light in the optical. The SCD corresponds to that is in black, which you see has nice extreme ultraviolet continuum and then corresponding nice broad lines. But then eventually the optical emission takes a complete nose dive and your broad lines disappear. But at the same time, your SCD goes through this dramatic change where your entire EUV continuum is just disappeared. And so one way of explaining this is at this state condition, where you go from a disk dominated state at high mass pollution rates. To one dominated by an X ray plasma at low mass emission rates, similar to some state transitions you can see in local black hole memories. And so the question then is is this just rare behavior for these funky objects, or is it actually present in the wider AGM population? And so to test this, we need a sample. Uh, and we go to the X rays, because now we don't want to select based on broad lines or blue optical continuum, we want to select it. Agent regardless. And so with an X-ray selection, if you have an X-ray source which is super bright, like above 10 to 42 rows per second in a galaxy, it's probably an AGM. Um, 
And so we use given as eta. We use the impedance field because although you need the loss value, the impedance is the eta to have the best spectrum. Uh, and there's still 22,000 sorts of this, so more than a few Um, But in general, by nature of your band, so if we want to change the SCD, we also need some data points on the other side, so in the optical or the UV. And so we have uh, follow up types of line can imaging. And this is really quite nice for looking at these very not geometries because types of line can give these. Beautiful images of the galaxy. And if your name is Yun Yao Li or John Silverman, you can take these images and decompose the agent effect from the galaxy uh, and really dig out, even for the very of the objects, fairly robust fluxes when you're, when you're generally quite contaminated by the galaxy. And so you can really pull out just the agent SUV without having to worry about all this host galaxy contamination. And so we have a final sample then of about 3,500 objects. Uh, from which we only select the X-ray unobscured. Anything that is X-ray unobscured, so comments about the book about 10 to, 10 to 22, we discard because we don't want um, to look at sources where there's a bunch of material in our line site. We really want to look at what's going on in the, in the flow. And so we ignore anything that's, anything where stuff is getting in the way of our view. Now, so if we take the sample and um, drop it in terms of black hole mass, again, and not exactly in our so again, confirming for the power, um, you can see uh, we show the distribution in green boxes here. And then overlaid in the contours, you have where we've matched our sample to the SGSS agent sample. And immediately you notice we push a much lower lum uh, optical luminosity, so well below where we see this hard pepper in SGSS. And so you can think that then perhaps we are looking at agent below this transition. And so what we can do next is then take a single mass spin. Stack all of your SCDs within each bin and ask how does the SCD evolve with mass equation data. And so the way to read this plot is in orange you have the optical data, in blue you have the stack of zeta data, and then you start in the lowest bin, not the not bin at the top left corner, you increase as you go right, then you eventually run out of space on your projector, so you loop back around and continue increasing as you move right. First thing to notice is in the optical. In these bottom high luminosity bins, you have nice blue continuum, typical, what typically looks like a normal sacred. This is also where we have very black and SDSS. However, in your low luminosity bins, this is an extremely red spectrum. It does not look like the typical Asian continuum. If we look at the X, now you'll notice whilst the optical changed by several orders of magnitude, your X ray, total X ray power only changes marginally in comparison. The zoom curve in on the X-ray, you see in the soft X-ray that is low, then the soft, we have a soft excess in these high luminosity bins, but a complete lack of soft excess in low luminosity. That just looks like a single path. And so we think you can explain this with different equation states, where you go from this uh, state dominated by an X-ray plasma at low luminosity to a very strongly dominated state at high luminosity. But we can do better than just speculate, we can actually model it. Uh, and apply our model to see how this evolved. Um, and so what you see is it seems to smoothly transition the uh, mass equation rate going from here we have really, or you at least predict, really strong EV emission. It gets weaker and weaker as you reduce M dot. Eventually you get to the changing of the transition around about a few percent from Pennington. And then your green. Uh, compromised moment just completely collapses, and you're left with what looks a lot like a very hard state. And so, what we are saying, at least, is that at these high energy ratios, we are really strongly dystonic. We get a lot of ionizing emission, extreme ultraviolet emission. As you reduce n dot, your EV disk gets weaker, and you start to give way to more than X ray plasma. Eventually, you get to this changing up transition where you have comparable amounts of power in your. UV disk and your X-ray, and you start grabbing this transitional region before you eventually collapse into just what looks like a hot X-ray cut. And so with the SCD, we are beginning to pick out uh, an idea of the overall structure of the accretion flow and what the different accretion states look like. However, this is just a fairly coarse overview. It doesn't really give you any details about what the accretion flow is doing. And so if you want to zoom in and ask, okay, this is sort of 
for the real description of psychosis and detailed description of the And to do that, we're going to look at the variability. So now we cite back into almost a different uh, topic and ask, how can we use the variability to really zoom in and understand the detailed picture, the detailed physics of the equation plane? And this is one metric because we're in an area where we have really good data for variability studies, where we now have nice intensively monitored AGM from uh, data from the X-ray all the way down to the UV optical. And these light curves go on for about another three years, so they should really end by the window over there, but I didn't have space to show all of them. Um, and so what you can do with these, because what these are essentially telling you is how your SCD varies. And so by comparing the variability in the UV optical to, for example, that of the X-ray, you can start to look at the physical link between your different emitting systems in the place, so the link between your discs and the X-ray crew in them, uh, and really ask what's going on. Now, if we're going to talk about variability, we should talk a bit about what is it that's actually driving the variability. Originally, these campaigns were motivated by the motivation. Now, it's probably the easiest way to drive the variability, or one of the easiest ways to drive the variability in Asia. So you think about, the, if you go back to standard theory, these are standard Shakur's in our discs, on the time scales that we observe, they should not vary. And so, you're left with, okay, an X-ray plasma, this geometrically much thicker structure, much um, lower density, lower viscosity, that can vary. And so if you're highly variable X-rays, you get more or less isotopically, some of them instant on the disk, some of them get absorbed, some of them heat the disk, and that modulates your UV optical emission. And so the idea there is that your UV optical light curve is entirely driven by this X-ray reprocessing but with some time lag from the light count time. This is relatively easy to test. So we can build reverberation models that will take an X-ray light curve and an SED and predict exactly what the UV optical light curve will look like. And generally when you do that, it doesn't work. And not only does it not work, it fails in completely different ways for different objects. Um, and the way it fails seems to depend on the SED. So, for example, Pyro 9, you've got a really strong UV continuum, whereas the Photon 51, you've got, well, you have to change the milk transition, so you're looking sort of comparable amount of how UV X ray. Um, and so this links back into the different equation structures, and maybe that's, this is telling us something about the variability in different equations for different equation structures. But the question we should be asking then is okay, if we're not for the variation, what is actually driving the variability. And so we'll zoom in on Pedal 9, my favorite object, probably because I spent an entire PhD looking at it, um, and ask the light curves, what are you doing? So you've got the light curves on the left, and then you've got all the correlations on the right. The way to think about uh, ACF is it's time range on your power spectrum. So it's telling you about the variability time scale. So if you've got a really broad ACF, like the UV in green here, that's telling you you're dominated by nice, slow, long-term variability. Whereas if you've got a fairly narrow ACF, like your X-rays in blue, that's telling you you're dominated by quite fast, short-term variations. You notice that the variation model has almost identical time scale to the X-ray, and that's because the light travel time to your disk is so short, it doesn't smooth out these fast, these fast variations. And so what? These light curves we think are telling us is that you have at least two different processes going on in the flow, which are driving your variations. One fast giving rise to your X ray variability, but then another, there needs to be another slow process giving you your UV. And so we can go back to our drawing board and readjust our pictures a bit. We've already had that X ray is an variable. You can think about this again, it would be a dramatically thick, low density flow. It's easy to stir up turbulence on short time scales, and so you can be highly variable. Think of it as sort of fluctuating in your local mass accretion rate. If you make local mass, mass accretion rate fluctuating, that can turn give you fluctuations in your flux. But then if we zoom out to our disk like structure, this we're now saying, okay, but let's also have this as being physically variable. But now you're much denser than the X-ray plasma, you're geometrically finished. And so your variability is much slower, it's being driven on much longer time scales and giving you these long term trends that you see in the data. But this is an accreting system, and so if you have fluctuations in your local mass accretion rate, 
they will preferentially move down through the plane. And this is a multiplicative uh, process. And so what this means is that your slow variability in the after this eventually propagates down into your extra corner and modulates this fast extra variability, giving it an underlying slow trend. And so it predicts then that on long enough time scales, if you have a long light curve, you should be able to see underneath this new path of fluctuations an additional long-term trend in the next week. But we still can get to the isotopically, and so they still, some of them are still on the disk, and so it will still give you a fast but weak reverberation signal in the UV optical. And then, because we don't have enough time scale to keep track of already, um, we're saying that X rays come from seeds, they come from the disk, they come from scattered. These also have to be but now on your light travel time rather than the propagation time. And so, we have a few different time scales to keep track of at the same time. And we have computers which can solve this. Uh, and so, you can put all of this together into a full model which starts start to calculate the variability throughout the XCD, throughout the equation flow, and ask you what does it do. And so, here you're seeing on the right, you have the SED or individual, well, you've got the variable SED. And then on the left, uh, like uh, this, have been extracted in the you the optical in the bottom and then X ray in the top. And you immediately see that the X ray, the blue X ray light curve, is clearly dominated by these fast variations, whereas the UV optical is dominated by more slow, long term variability. However, because we simulate this for about three years, the X ray variability does have this nice long term trend underneath it. Uh, and again, if we go back to our correlation functions, these look surprisingly similar to the ones that um, we get from the data, where UV optical is dominated by light broad components and your X-ray is dominated by the map. So, however, although we can at least generate light curves which look more or less like real light curves, there is a slight caveat which you'll notice if we zoom in on the optical. And that comes down to the lax. Because we're thinking about propagation, these uh, uh, should go, these start in the outer disk, which is fairly cold, and then move inwards, and modulating the emission from at uh, high energies. And so you end up with this effect where if you compare the time uh, or the variability in each light curve, you should have this effect where low energy emission is leading high energy emission, so giving you negative lags. However, uh, data generally show lags again the other direction, so positive with um, uh, low energy emission following high energy. But this is in part because just having a disk and a kernel is a bit too simplistic for Asia. We know they are more complicated than that. We know they have generally have these nice large scale structures like the winds or the VLR. And these subtend a lot of solid angle as seen from the disk. And so they will see this intrinsically variable EUV emission coming from the disk. And because the EUV is where all the atomic physics happens, it's optically tipped to more or less anything, it will be absorbed. And so some of it can reprocess and be limited as this diffuse free band continue, giving you an additional variable but lag component to the SED. And so we can take this and actually calculate what does the diffuse continuum do and what does it look like and how does it affect variability. And so what you're seeing here again on the right is a zoom in of the optical part of FCB, where now in the red we have the additional contribution from the diffuse rebound emission. And then on the left you have the light curves where the colored ones are only include this large scale wind, and then black ones in the blues. And you can see it has an impact on the variability. But the, how much impact it has depends on how much your diffuse is contributing to the SCB. So in UVW2, so sort of around about 2000 angstrom or so, you're mostly seeing clean discontinuum, and so you're not really having much of an effect. How down to like U and V band, where you see the bar mirror jump, the passion continue. Now the wind is contributing much more to your overall SED, and so it contributes much more to your light curve. And because the light travel time to uh, wind is so much shorter than the variability time scale we're generating on, it adds, it still coheres, and so it adds constructively and gives you a boost to the observed variability. And so we can repeat the same exercise as before and ask what the lags do, and they switch. And this is important because you're always comparing to your the highest energy you have. 
So we're comparing to clean disk emission, but the, uh, as we go to lower energy, the longer wavelengths, they're being more and more dominated by the swing. And so you're diluting the SED, and that uh, gives, uh, so it gives you a stronger contribution to the overall energy. And then copy pasting the data from on this paper, um, it works surprisingly well considering there's not been fit. This was essentially our best guess for the wind roughly here, and they seemed to go from the big. I mean, it could obviously do better, but roughly it shows the same sort of trend. And so, in summary, what we have is the SED giving us an overview of the energy generating structure and telling us about these different equation states. And then the variability letting us zoom in and telling us about the detailed structure going on in these systems. And they both come with a whole slew of predictions, which I've not had time to uh, go through yet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very nice talk. Do we have any questions? Thank you, very interesting talk. Yeah, so I have a question for that uh, picture that you are showing with the intermediate part of the disk, which is uh, strongly compromised, the green one. Yes. Um, so you invert that based on population studies of AGM. Any chance you can see such a transition, such a collapse in an individual source? What are the types? Changing the AGM. Certainly. So we see the change. So for example, example I showed for. Um, uh, Markovian 1018. Mm -hmm. This one, for example. So here you do see, because there is absolutely no EU continuum in this layer, SED, you would need this warm compromising disk to give you the EU continuum. Um, and so in these cases, you can see this collapse in more or less real time if you've got good ones. Uh, and the time scale is. Yes. Yeah. Can you comment more on the similarity to uh, state changes in black hole LMXPs fees in particular, where they go into a hard state and then transition to a soft state, and that's all attributed to the disk model that uh, was developed on your buildings. Work very well. Can that really be transferred to a much larger ACM? So, be surprised if it really No, so the things that would mm -hmm. trigger the state change in AGM would not, I don't think, would transfer from micro windings because then you have a general model, I mean, uh, probably disk instability is like to start on the outer disk, which ends up to get inwards. For AGM, these, or at least like a wine, these differences are generally down to hydrogen ionization, which for AGM could go much further in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not entirely sure what triggers them in AGM. Uh, we're basing this off that the SEDs are remarkably similar to what you get in like or binaries, but it's certainly still a question as to what would actually cause this to happen. Yeah. But it definitely does. Something similar does seem to happen, but we see these changes in space. Right. Do we see the same hard to soft transition in change of looks? I didn't know that we did. Hard to soft. And they sometimes turn back on again. So we do see them go from, but it's usually they've not previously been identified as AGN, so it's usually because they've left their galaxy again and suddenly have blown emission lines. And so it's, and so EUV has come back, and so that, um, in some sense, will have turned back on. Um, but we're all very much in low numbers of statistics because they're hard to find. Yeah. Thank you. Good talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Do we have questions online? Okay. Well, thank you. We'd like to thank you and thank you all, all of you for being here on like a special seminar. And um, I assume we have lots of uh, available time slots yes. to meet with the speakers. So if you have any questions or would like to discuss something, um, we have plenty of time slots available. So thank you. Thank you.